Here's what's going on at this hour. Andy Dalton is on the market and it appears the Jaguars are very interested. That is according to a report from ESPN. Dalton released by the Bengals yesterday after nine seasons in Cincinnati. Even if Jacksonville picks him up, ESPN reporting Gardner Minshew is still the favorite to start week one. The Dolphins, meanwhile, they have traded defensive end Charles Harris to the Falcons for a seventh round pick in next year's draft. Harris is a former first round selection for Miami who had three and a half sacks in three seasons. The move comes a day after Miami released another defensive end in Taco Charlton. And Bronco star Von Miller announced yesterday he is now negative for coronavirus. Three weeks ago, the former Super Bowl MVP revealed he had come down with COVID-19 and urged everyone to take the virus seriously. Welcome to Fantasy Football Today, or should we just call this the Heath Cummings Show? We're talking Dynasty Rankings on today's episode, and Heath Cummings, the driving force behind our Dynasty Rankings here at CBS Sports. I'm Jamie, that's Heath, that's Adam, that's Dave. We're going to break it down by position, quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end. And Heath, are you ready? Oh, I'm ready. There is nothing more fun than having Adam Azer pick apart my Dynasty Rankings. Well, Dave's going to take part in that as well. Just uh, before we get into it, what do you do in terms of going about setting these dynasty rankings? How do you sort of go about the process? I generally start with a couple of things that are pretty basic. My 2020 projections, the age of the player factors in heavily as well. And then I, to go from there, I do have a factor for upside and a factor for risk. And those are obviously subjective. They're, they're my opinion. But you start with the age, you, you go with the projection, Factor in some upside and some risk, and you spit out a number. All right, well, Adam's like a rabid dog, ready to go to tear these things apart, and uh, Dave's not far behind him. So let's get right to it. Let's start with the quarterback position. I'm going to take a look at the top 10 dynasty rankings that Heath has. These are like looking at it as if you're starting a startup dynasty league, but obviously they apply to any established dynasty leagues. If maybe you're looking to make some trades as well, the rookies are now factored in following the NFL draft. And as you see, Patrick Mahomes at the top, all the way down to Jared Goff at number 10. In the middle there, though, we have a little bit of an interesting debate. You got Deshaun Watson at number three, Kyler Murray at number four, and Dak Prescott at number five. Why Watson over both Murray and Prescott? And there will be several times where I say this probably, but this is a tier that you've selected perfectly. Watson, Murray, Prescott, all much closer to each other than they are to Josh Allen or Lamar Jackson. What I will say, though, Watson kind of has the best of all worlds. Age-wise, he gets the same benefit that Kyler Murray does because if you are 25 or younger, I don't really care how much younger you are. He's going to be playing at a very high level for the next five years. He also has something in common with Dak Prescott in that both Prescott and Watson have already shown us the ability to be a top two or top three fantasy quarterback. With Kyler Murray, it's mostly still just projection. We haven't actually seen it yet. And part of that is because they have swapped number one wide receivers. They got Deshaun, uh, Deshaun Watson loses DeAndre Hopkins. Kyler Murray gains Hopkins. Dave, I know for you in seasonal leagues, you're taking Murray over Watson. Are you doing that in Dynasty as well? I'm not sure if I'm doing it in Dynasty. I, I think that Deshaun Watson could have a bad year this year, at least comparable to his other years. It still could be a top five type of year for him. But long term, he's going to be a bright star in the NFL. I think there isn't any doubt about that. And Kyler Murray, he's right. He started off hot last year, but we are really basing everything on his upside. The one thing I can say is that as a former number one overall pick, Murray has already shown that he is capable of playing at this level. I think he's got room to improve. So I'm not really going to argue that hard to put Murray ahead or behind anybody here. The fact that he's the youngest of the three and that he's younger than Deshaun Watson does give him an edge. But I think I would prefer Watson. All right, Adam, make the case for Prescott out of that trio. Coming off the best year of the three of those guys from a season ago, he just got an added weapon in CeeDee Lamb. Are you taking Prescott over both Watson and Murray for the long haul? No, I'll make the case because you asked me to, Jamie, and I'm in such a great mood, you know, just being able to pick apart Heath's rankings. I'll do any, I'll do whatever you want. Um, I would take him last. In fact, I would take Russell Wilson ahead of Dak Prescott, even though there's an age difference there. But Wilson, only 31 years old, still has, I think, five good years left in him. But Dak, look, he seems like kind of safe, right? They locked up Amari Cooper. There are some 
some interesting guarantees in the contract. They could get rid of Cooper if they want, but they locked him up for a while. They have C.D. Lamb. They still have a good offensive line. I expect it to be very good for at least two more years. I got no issue with Dak Prescott, except last year was totally an outlier for him. I'm a little worried that he just had his Kirk Cousins season, where Cousins had one year where he threw for about 4,800 yards and has never come close to that. But Dak's good. I just I can't make that impassioned of a case for him over Watson and Murray because I, I don't really believe it, Jamie. I do think he should actually be sixth behind Russell Wilson. Mark the tape, May 1st, 2020. Adam Azer comparing Dak Prescott to Kirk Cousins. That's something we will never let him live down. Let's go now to uh, Joe Burrow, who comes in at number nine. Heath, did you have any struggle with where to put Burrow because maybe he's better than some of the guys that are ahead of him? Maybe it could be worse. We just don't know. So how'd you go about the process with Burrow? Yeah, I think I could make an argument if I was really asked to and I'd do a better job of it than Adam Azer just did, ranking Burrow as high <laughs> as number six, as low as 12 or 13. There's still plenty of unknown here. I think he has as much upside as anybody that's not in the top three or four quarterbacks. And that's just based on what he did last year in college, which was better than just about anybody's college year ever. So I do think there's significant risk, though. The only quarterback in the top 10 that I have given more risk to is Josh Allen. And that's just because we haven't seen Joe Burrow in the NFL yet. And he really did only have one year of elite production in college. So he kind of it's right in the middle. There's certainly upside beyond where he's ranked, but there's a whole lot of downside as well. Adam, where do you come out on Burrow and maybe project three years for him? Uh, do you see him maybe in the conversation as a top three guy or could be looking at him as somebody that's not even in the top 15? Yeah, I think there are a wide range of outcomes. I would put him ahead of Josh Allen. I would probably put him ahead of Dak Prescott, to be quite honest. I'd go Mahomes, Jackson, Murray, Watson, Wilson, Burrow, Prescott. How about that? Let me just read you all a list of the quarterbacks who were taken number one since 2001. And this is the range of outcomes you could be getting. Michael Vick, David Carr, Carson Palmer, Eli Manning, Alex Smith, Jamarcus Russell, Matthew Stafford, Sam Bradford, Cam Newton, Andrew Luck, Jameis Winston, Jared Goff, Baker Mayfield, Kyler Murray, and now Joe Burrow. Most of them don't deserve to be a, you know, a top 10 dynasty guy. Most of them were kind of disappointing considering they were the number one overall pick. I'm not criticizing his pick. Like I said, I'd have him in the top eight. But uh, there are a wide range of outcomes. I'm confident in Burrow, and he, and he can run a little bit too. But just, just beware, it's not a slam dunk. Mark the tape, May 1st, 2020. Adam says, I'm not <laughs> criticizing Heath's pick. Dave, where do you come out on Burrow? <laughs> I, I like the prospect. And, you know, Adam just ran off a list of names. Burrow's film from college is better than the majority of those quarterbacks, if you ask me. I'm bullish on Burrow. I, I would absolutely have him ahead of Carson Wentz. I don't know if I'd put him ahead of Dak, though. I think that might just be a, a step too far because of the risk involved, what if we're wrong? He is a Bengal, after all. But we have seen the Bengals the last couple of uh, last couple of quarterbacks they've drafted. I was going to say the last couple of years. It's more like the last couple of decades. They've had a quarterback stay in that position for a long time. The floor for Joe Burrow is that he's a competent quarterback who can be okay for fantasy. The ceiling is that he's a top five fantasy quarterback for the next 15 years. Well, that's what you'd be doing if you're taking him in the top 10. So. I think Heath's in the right range, depending on if you want to go a little bit higher, like Dave and Adam said, or maybe a little bit lower. But I think, you know, you're in that spot, Heath. So good job with the Burrow ranking at number nine. Let's take a look now at the quarterbacks, 11 through 20. And this is a little bit of a surprise to see some of the names here because you're missing some of the key veterans. I've seen age factors in there. But when we get to the guy at number 12, I'm just curious because this is going to be a fun one. When did Heath become a Giants fan, putting Daniel Jones all the way up at number 12, Heath? Tell me Mark about the that tape, one. Jamie. Mark the tape. <laughs> I I just think like there are a lot of similarities when I look at like predictive fantasy performance of Josh Allen and Daniel Jones. They both struggle throwing the football. They're both good athletes that can run it pretty well. They both have profiles that suggest if they improve their accuracy, they could be very good. NFL quarterbacks and fantasy quarterbacks. Jones has a nice floor in fantasy because of what we think that he will do with his legs over the next three or four years. And he's still very young. In fact, probably more likely to improve since he's only one year in than Allen as a passer. And at this point in the rankings, you're really just worried about what they could be because downside doesn't matter all that much. 
Dave, talk, talk about Daniel Jones in comparison to the guy that's one spot ahead of him, Baker Mayfield, because at this time last year, Baker was probably a top 10 guy coming off of his rookie season. And now we're looking at him as hopefully trying to rebound from what we saw last year in the disappointing 2019 campaign. Daniel Jones, could he be better than Baker? Or would you rather have Baker if you're making that selection? He could be better than Baker. I think the difference is that Baker, if he has another bad year in 2020, he could be really close to hitting the drain and being a washout quarterback like a lot of the former number one overall quarterbacks that Adam Mazur named were. Of course, if he has a great season, then it's completely out the window, and you'll be glad that you took Baker Mayfield ahead of Daniel Jones. I totally get why he ranked Jones where he did. And frankly, because of what I think is going to be at least a three-year window for him as Joe Judge's quarterback in New York, a good skill set, and the fact that he's young, there isn't another quarterback that is in a situation like him that's ranked behind him in Heath's rankings that I would rather have. Baker is one that I would rather have ahead of him, though. I'll take the chance that for one year, Baker Mayfield does step up, prove that he was worth the number one pick, and stewards the Browns franchise for the next five to seven seasons. I think he would put up better numbers long-term than Daniel Jones. All right, so Dave agreeing with Heath of having Baker ahead of Jones, but Jones at number 12, maybe ahead of Tua Tagovailoa, could be a little bit of a surprise. Adam, you were talking all throughout the draft process that you thought Tua, if healthy, would be better then Joe Burrow. Now you see him with Miami going after Burrow in the NFL draft. He's behind Daniel Jones in Heath's rankings. How does Tua sort of compare to Daniel Jones as well? All right, listen, first of all, I don't know that he'll be better than Joe Burrow. I just think it's a fair question to ask. Maybe I made like a bold prediction about that, but don't, please don't mark the tape on that one. Uh, <laughs> and, and it is a fair question to ask because going into, going into this year, Tua was the number one quarterback prospect. Burrow had this huge year. Tua got hurt, but Tua still had a really good season. I don't really remember your question. I like Tua Tag Tagovailoa. Um, I think that I would take him ahead of Daniel Jones in a one quarterback dynasty league. I would take him behind Daniel Jones in a two quarterback dynasty league. Why? Because just can't really find anybody on waivers or a super flex or a two quarterback league. He's obviously riskier, but he has a lot more upside than Jones. I, I don't like the comparison that Heath made Jones to Josh Allen, by the way. Jones is a much more accurate passer. His completion percentage has nothing to do with his accuracy yet. Uh, that's I, that's a leap. But um, no, two is interesting at 14. Everybody behind him is like, Ugh, I don't really want to build my franchise around that. I think that's the last guy that I look at other than maybe Justin Herbert that I want to build my franchise around. Maybe Dwayne Haskins, obviously going with these young guys. But if you're looking at Heat's dynasty quarterback rankings, I really like uh, where he has Tua. And obviously, I mean, there's a chance Tua is the best quarterback in football in a few years. So that'd be uh, one I'd be interested in taking in a dynasty startup league. Adam referenced Justin Herbert. He's outside of the top 20 for Heath. Tell us why. Are you concerned about Herbert being a long-term starter for the Chargers or just not being that good? Yes. No, I, I just think that there is a big gap between Burrow and Tua and getting down to Herbert. I don't think he has, like, I, I raised my eyebrow, eyebrows a little bit when Adam said that Tua could be the best quarterback in football in, in three years. I do think that he legitimately could be a top five quarterback in football in three years. I, mean, I think Patrick Mahomes is still going to be playing football in three years. But I don't really see that type of upside with Herbert. And then it kind of goes back to the first question you asked me. I start out here with 2020 projections. I don't know how soon Herbert gets on the field because the Chargers have put a very good team around Tyrod Taylor. He does not have to be very good to win games. And I think as long as they're in playoff contention, it's likely that Taylor is the starting quarterback. So you may not have a lot of long-term upside with Herbert. You also might not be able to start him in 2020, even in a two-quarterback league. And you have Herbert ranked in number 21. I'm going to go off script here for a second just because of some of the news that we're, you know, dealing with after Andy Dalton being released and the report that he could be looking at Jacksonville as his likely destination. You have Gardner Minshew at number 16. So, Heath, if Dalton does sign with the Jaguars, and you heard what Amanda Guerra said at the start of the show, not guaranteed to be the starter week one in terms of Dalton, that still could be Minshew. How much would you drop Minshew if Dalton ends up in Jacksonville? Yeah, I think you probably have to drop him back down to the 25-26 uh, range, that Dwayne Haskins range, where you're hoping that they get are, are a starting quarterback for 16 games this season, but you're not absolutely sure. You believe there's some upside to possibly be a low-end number one quarterback, but they may not even start. It would be a, it wouldn't be a terrible situation for Minshew if Dalton was the one they signed. I was kind of concerned still about Cam Newton. I was very concerned before Jameis Winston was signed. Those two would have been a much bigger threat to Minshew, both in 2020 and beyond. 
Dave, when you look at some of the guys that Heath has ranked 11 through 20, uh, I'm looking at guys like Drew Locke, Sam Darnold, Jimmy Garoppolo. Obviously, age factors in here, but Aaron Rodgers, 35. Would you take him ahead of all those guys just based on what you could get maybe in the short term compared to those guys long term? I think I would because I can win now with Rodgers and, and I feel like there's a little less risk with him now versus someone like Drew Locke, who I think does have potential to be great. I'd actually love to have both those guys on my team. And maybe one of my strategies, if I'm doing a dynasty startup, is if, if I can't get good value on one of the quarterbacks in the top 10 or so, I'll just wait and I'll pair a veteran with a young player and hope that in time, I won't have to address the, the position ever again. But we know that the Packers seem to be heading toward a run-first mentality. We know that Aaron Rodgers may not finish his career in Green Bay, and when he does change teams, he might be asked to throw a bunch more. Uh, someone floated the idea that when Tom Brady steps away from the Bucks in two years, Aaron Rodgers will be ready to go to replace him in Tampa Bay. That would be incredible to pair him with Bruce Arians. I would love that. So I, I think I'm still taking Rodgers ahead of Drew Locke and ahead of a lot of the other unproven quarterbacks who just have youth on Rodgers. That's the only factor they've got that makes them even possibly more appealing than A-Rod. And that's what that's what Heath was alluding to when he explained how he goes about his dynasty rankings. Rodgers is a little bit older, so leaning on youth there. So there's a sneak peek at the quarterback rankings for Dynasty. You can check out more of Heath's rankings on CBSSports.com. When we come back here, though, on the show, we're going to start to look at the running backs and get into some of the values for maybe some of the questionable guys, some of the older running backs, and certainly some of the rookies. But what does this mean for Aaron Jones now that he has a rookie on his team? What about Derrick Henry coming off 400-plus touches? We'll tell you about the dynasty value for those guys next year on HQ. Welcome back to Fantasy Football Today. We're taking a look at Dynasty Rankings, the Heath Cummings Show. Heath is responsible for our Dynasty Rankings here at CBS Sports, and we're going to pick them apart or just give them some praise for some good placement on certain players. Let's start with the running backs here. After we just got finished talking about the quarterbacks in our previous segment, the running backs in the top 10, probably not a big surprise with the guys at the top. You're starting at Christian McCaffrey, looking at the guys that are studs in redraft leagues. But no surprise about some of these names as we keep going. Saquon Barkley, Alvin Kamara, Dalvin Cook, Ezekiel Elliott. You see the superstars there. And then there could be a little bit of a discussion once we get past number nine. Clyde Edwards-Hilaire. You just got finished listening to Amanda Guerra say that there's a report. Brett Veach, the general manager of the Chiefs, saying Damian Williams could still be the starter in week one. Maybe still the starter for most of the season after the Chiefs drafted Edwards-Hilaire with the 32nd pick in the first round of the NFL draft. So Heath, how did you settle on Edward Hilaire at number 10? What was the process there? Yeah, I do have him slated to be in a committee for most of 2020. I don't think he's going to come anywhere close to like 300 touches, even 280 touches, I, I don't think is, is really possible. And I think you look at the guy right above him, Austin Eckler, who's given us a top five fantasy season on limited touches. And I think that's the blueprint right there for Clyde edwards Elair to be a fantasy star from the very get-go. There's just a little bit more risk from him in year one and a lot more upside from him in the long term. But right now he's slated at number 10 because he's so far behind those first nine guys in terms of what I have of a 2020 projection. Adam, when you look at, uh, maybe start with Nick Chubb at number six. Miles Sanders, we know you love him, number seven. Jacobs at eight. Eckler at nine. Like he said, for him, Edwards Hilaire very far behind them. But, again, we're looking long term. Would you take Edwards Hilaire over any of those guys that are ranked in the first nine? No, uh, just Eckler. I would move Edwards Hilaire up one spot to nine and, and put Eckler behind him. But no, because you don't know how good he is. It could be Sony Michelle or Rashad Penny. I love the landing spot. I, I think he's going to be really good. I think he deserves to be a top 10 guy, but there's uncertainty. Whereas I'm pretty convinced that Nick Chubb, Miles Sanders, and Josh Jacobs are great NFL running backs with really bright futures. In fact, you want a little bit of a hot take? I put all of them ahead of Ezekiel Elliott. Wow. So Zeke behind Chubb, behind Sanders, behind Jacobs. And I mean, look, for a guy that's got a lot of work in terms of Elliott, that could be something that people want to keep an eye on moving forward. Dave, I want to ask you about Jacobs and Sanders because they're going to kind of be married together a lot in the same draft class from a year ago. Right now, Sanders the better fantasy prospect just based on what he showed us last year. Jacobs, although not far behind, would like to see him do a little bit more in the passing game. But three years from now, project out. Who's going to be the better of that duo? 
the better running back is going to be Miles Sanders. And it's going to be a byproduct of where these guys are playing. And you look at Philadelphia and Miles Sanders, the only competition he's got for playing time now is is Boston Scott. And maybe they add more pieces around him, but I don't think there's going to be anybody there that's really going to threaten him. And it's not like there's a huge threat for Josh Jacobs' touches in, in Vegas, but Lynn Bowden's there and Jalen Richard's there. And if Josh Jacobs is just a two down back, I think it really limits his upside. So I, I think the, I'm debating between who would I take first between Jacobs and Clyde Edwards Elaire in a dynasty PPR startup. And I think I might give the nod to Edwards Elaire because I know he's a good pass catching running back. And his floor, say over the next five to six years, is a guy that works in passing downs. For the Chiefs, they throw a lot. I think that that would be pretty good for him. Whereas Josh Jacobs, a year like he had last year, you, maybe you, you speculated out, or not speculate, you know what I mean, but 16 games of it, he'd probably be okay. But I think Edward Ziller might have a little bit more upside in PPR. I'm with you. I would take him over Tubb as well. I think there's just a lot more upside for him as the uh, future of the Chiefs backfield. It may not be right away, but Brett Veach also in the same conversation talking about Williams still being the starter. He did say that this is a generational type of talent. Maybe not necessarily in those words, but he did say that he's got certainly the talent level to be a potential superstar. I'm just, you know, throwing glowing adjectives on this way because I love the kid. Uh, let's go now to the list 11 through 20, and we see a couple of guys here that could be a little bit concerning for seasonal leagues, let alone dynasty formats. You have Aaron Jones at number 11, Derrick Henry at number 14, and you see Jones. We know the Packers added a running back in the second round with A.J. Dillon. Derrick Henry coming off the season that he had a year ago, uh, over 400 total touches when you factor in the playoffs, and he is only right now on the franchise tag, so may not get a long-term deal from the Titans. Could be looking at maybe leaving Tennessee after the season. Heath. Tell me about those two guys. Why Jones at 11? Why Henry at 14? Yeah, I just, and this will vary greatly depending on your 2020 expectations for Jones and Henry, I think, because we're still talking about relatively young backs, especially Jones just 25, even Henry's 26. The 400 carries or touches a little bit troubling, but they're young backs that for me project as top 10, top 12 backs in 2020. And I don't think there's a risk that Aaron Jones yeah, he might leave Green Bay after this year. I don't think there's the risk that he's one of those backs that after his fourth year just can't find a job. I don't think there's a risk that if Derrick Henry only has one more year in Tennessee, he just can't find a job. I think they're both very talented. Jones just a little bit younger, a little bit less of an injury concern possibly this year. Immense upside, though. If you told me for sure that Derrick Henry was going to play 16 games this season, I'd have him as a top three running back in non-PPR. I think just his combination of size, speed, and situation right now is absolutely elite. There's some question marks for the future. That's why he fell to 14. He could easily be in the top 10 for me. We, uh, our, our buddy Ben Gretsch said that he would take Jonathan Taylor ahead of Clyde Edwards-Hilaire if he was doing a rookie-only draft. And so you have Jonathan Taylor behind Edwards Hilaire here, only by a couple spots. But Dave, when you look at Taylor and we're projecting forward here, most likely going to be the starter at some point this season for the Colts. At least that's the hope. And certainly in 2021, we expect him to be the lead back for Indianapolis. Should he be higher? Should he be a guy that we're considering in the top 10? I'd take him over Aaron Jones in a heartbeat because I think that he's got at least a four or five year window. And maybe that includes this year, but a window of being the lead running back for the Indianapolis Colts. Two fifths of that offensive line is young. Five fifths of that offensive line is awesome, and he's going to end up being a big factor for the Colts long term. He's been higher on Jonathan Taylor more than anybody else on the show, so I'm surprised that he's ranking this low. And I disagree about Aaron Jones. If he has a great year this year, then maybe he ends up staying in Green Bay, and they give him the type of contract that you know a lot of running backs get you eight, nine, ten million dollars a year. But if it's a bad year. Packers can go like this with their hands. He's gone. They drafted A.J. Dillon. I think there's more to Dillon going to Green Bay than meets the eye. And I think Aaron Jones is definitely on thin ice with the Packers unless he comes through this year. Adam, when you look at DeAndre Swift, uh, he's still going to have to deal with Carrion Johnson for 2020, maybe 2021 as well, just based on uh, Johnson's contract situation. But Swift was another one that we were saying could be the best running back in this class. Didn't exactly love the landing spot for him with the Lions, but should he be a little bit higher just favoring youth and what he could do if he ends up being that lead running back for Detroit for not only 2020, but beyond? Yeah, I mean, he's got DeAndre Swift behind three veteran running backs who might not be very good. Leonard Fournette, Todd Gurley, and Le'Veon Bell. 
it's funny to say that about Gurley and Bell. They were at times the best running back in football, but I think they're I think they're pretty much done. Le'Veon Bell hasn't had a carry of 30 yards in two seasons, which is three years. He didn't have a 20-yard carry last year. So I would definitely take DeAndre Swift over Todd Gurley and Le'Veon Bell in a dynasty league. He's five years younger than Gurley, and he's seven years younger than Le'Veon Bell. I mean, I just don't understand that at all. Why is Le'Veon Bell in the top 20 in a dynasty in a dynasty league? He, I think he's got one year of work left, and then his career is, as, a, as a fantasy starter is just about over. Um, yeah, so I do think DeAndre Swift should be higher. I think he should be around 15 or 16. Uh, Detroit's a terrible landing spot. They haven't had a 1,000-yard rusher since 2013. They haven't had anything close to that in like five years. Their offensive line stinks. They're going to have a new coaching staff probably in 2021. Uh, but I, I like the talent and the age, and he should be higher. All right, Heath, defend yourself. Why is Le'Veon Bell so high at number uh, 18? Well, and like I said, we, I, what I wish I could do is put together two sets of dynasty rankings, one for contenders and one for teams that are building for the future. Because for teams that are building for the future, DeAndre Swift should probably be a top 15 back. Le'Veon Bell should not be in the top 40. For teams that are contending this year, I'm not sure DeAndre Swift should be a top 30 back and Le'Veon Bell should probably be in the top 15. So it's just hard to balance those two things. I still think, and these are PPR rankings, I still think in PPR, Le'Veon Bell is likely to be a top 12, number one starting running back this year. He was nearly that last year with terribly terrible efficiency, and I expect that to improve. All right, let's go now to the list 21 through 30. You'll see a few more veteran running backs on list, this list as well with Chris Carson. Uh, you see um, Melvin Gordon, who we know changing teams. Interesting report coming out of Seattle about Carson that he should be ready for week one coming off of his hip injury. But Rashad Penny may be on the pup list to open the season because of his ACL injury, which could be a little bit worse than maybe was initially reported. J.K. Dobbins, Cam Akers, another couple of rookies on this list, along with Keyshawn Vaughn. So Keith, uh, Dobbins is somebody that, again, this may differ in terms of contender versus building for the future. But Dobbins, as we know, could be the lead guy for the Ravens in 2021, going to be in a shared situation, at least for 2020, with Mark Ingram still there. So is this a little bit too low for Dobbins? Uh, again, how did you go about the process of putting him in this spot? I really struggle with the landing spot in Baltimore and what it's going to mean. I know it meant a ton of touchdowns to Mark Ingram last year, and that was awesome. And I think it will mean an increasing workload for Dobbins in the future after Ingram's gone. But we're talking about a guy who's probably, at this point, hoping to be the number two in Baltimore at the start of the year. I wouldn't say that's guaranteed. And then even once he becomes the lead back, the way they ran things last year, the way I'd expect them to run things in the future, he's probably looking at 35 to 40 percent of the team's overall rush attempts because Lamar Jackson's going to take up a chunk and they're going to use a second back regularly. The other thing that really hurts, I liked Dobbins as a pass catcher. I'm not sure we get to see much of that with his landing spot in Baltimore. And in PPR, that hurts just a little bit. Yes, if you're not competing in 2020, this is too low. He's a top 20 option for you. But if you have any inclination of trying to score a lot of fantasy points in 2020, this, this definitely hurts him. One thing we did speak about on our Fantasy Football Today podcast on Friday, you can find that wherever podcasts are found about Lamar Jackson, maybe just you know how he develops as a quarterback. Maybe that's just something that changes a little bit for him from 2019 to 2020. Adding somebody like Dobbins, maybe they throw the ball to their backs a little bit more. Just something to keep in mind that as they continue to tweak and grow, and certainly grow his performance, that maybe Jackson can do some different things with some different caliber of talent around him. Uh, Adam, I want to ask you about Cam Akers and just the situation for him. Is this a, a scenario, if I were to tell you that you're getting Todd Gurley-like production from 2017, 2018, and Cam Akers maybe is that type of guy, how high could he be? Number one? <laughs> Are you going to tell me we're getting Todd Gurley production? Yeah, I, he would be He would be way up there. We're not going to get Todd Gurley production most likely because the Rams have a great offensive line, and Gurley, better prospect than Cam Akers, but... I think this is probably going to be the same situation for Heath. If you're building for the future and you're not contending, Cam Akers is definitely a top 20 pick. I don't want to put words in Heath's mouth. Of course, he can correct me. He's one spot behind J.K. Dobbins, so I just feel like whatever Heath said about Dobbins, you, you can say for Akers. I think Akers has more pass-catching potential, not just because of where he ended up, but because of his skill set. Um, I like Dobbins a little bit better, but I think Akers has, uh, has a really good opportunity. and and. Any of you know, Dobbins, Akers, any of these rookies, any of the first rookies that were taken in the first or second round, they could end up being the next great NFL running back. So if you can get him in the 20s in your dynasty draft, that's, that's pretty sick. 
Let's take a look now at list 31 through 40, and we get to uh, another veteran guy that I kind of want to tie into some of the guys that we've just been hitting on a little bit. So David Johnson, the first name on this list at 31, and you have, again, Melvin Gordon at 23. The other guys in the top 20 that Adam referenced that he thinks may be a little bit too high, and this kind of goes to the conversation of playing for now versus maybe playing for the future. Todd Gurley, Le'Veon Bell, James Conner, those guys that may not be long for their starting jobs. And so, Heath, when you have David Johnson at 31, I know you're a little bit... Um, not, I don't know, excited, but I know you're um, curious to see how Johnson's going to do with the move to the Texans. How do you factor in Johnson for 2020 and Johnson for beyond and, and those other veteran running backs as well? Yeah, I, I don't know that there is much of a beyond for David Johnson. I mean, he's had more injury problems than these guys as of late. He's changing teams now. He's going to a team that has Duke Johnson that's handled most of the third down work. And Johnson, David Johnson's really only been good as a pass catcher as of late. Hasn't been very good at, at all as a running back. So I don't have him as impactful in 2020 as the other guys you mentioned. He's a year older than Melvin Gordon, two years older than Gurley, the best comparison would be Le'Veon Bell and if I was going to move Bell back or David Johnson forward it would be moving Bell back just a little bit I do think 31 is just about right for Johnson maybe he gives you a year or two as a number two running back I don't see the same top 12 upside that I think is still there in 2020 for Gurley Bell and Gordon no I'm with you I think David Johnson belongs in the spot and you know, hopefully he turns things around with the Texans, but, you know, it's hard to bank on trading DeAndre Hopkins for David Johnson saying you won that trade if you're the Texans side of things. Uh, Dave, quickly, I want to ask you about the Buffalo situation. Heath has Zach Moss in this range, Devin Singletary in the uh, 21 to 30 range. When you look at the Buffalo backfield, again, you got a second year running back in Singletary and a rookie in Moss. Project those guys out for the next couple of years. The thing that really bothered me about Moss were the injuries that he had at Utah, and I'm wondering if he has a shelf life of maybe four years in the NFL. I see Singletary much differently. Uh, the Bills see him differently. They think that he's a passing downs type of running back. I think he can be a do-it-all back. I think he'll have a longer career. I agree with Heath that Singletary should be ranked higher than Moss. All right, so there you have the running backs. All the way through 40, again, you can check out the entire list and how Heath has it broken down between guys playing for the future. And if you're contending in your fantasy league now, you can see all of those lists on CBSSports.com. When we come back, though, we're going to take a look at the Dynasty wide receiver rankings and tell you about some guys that hopefully can rebound or maybe at least play better in some new situations. We're looking at Odell Beckham coming off of 4 2019 and DeAndre Hopkins now going from Houston, Arizona. We'll give you all the, running, the wide receiver breakdown next year on HQ. Welcome back to Fantasy Football. Today, we're breaking down the dynasty rankings that we have on CBSSports.com, courtesy of our buddy Heath Cummings. We're looking at the wide receiver position now. Let's take a look at the top 10 rankings that Heath has given us. Michael Thomas leading the way, Devontae Adams, and as you see, some of the usual cast of characters with the top four. But at number five, Juju Smith-Schuster coming off a disappointing 2019 campaign. Was that his fault, or was it the result of Ben Roethlisberger missing the result? The, Majority of the season with that elbow injury. So he's Juju. He's young. He's talented. He was great with Antonio Brown. How will he be moving forward? I'm just completely and totally giving him a pass on last year. I don't care at all. Bad receivers don't do what Juju Smith-Schuster did before his 22nd birthday. He was all world. He was getting 150 plus targets than Antonio Brown on the same team. He is going to be a stud. I. There have been some talk that Pittsburgh may not want to give him a contract extension. If that's fine, they will regret it. He'll go be a number one wide receiver someone else, somewhere else. He's a top 10 receiver this year. He still hasn't turned 24 years old yet. He's a top five dynasty receiver easy. Incredible what he's accomplished. Hopefully he'll do well in the number one role. That was the conversation going into last year. We didn't really get a chance to see how that would work with Roethlisberger, but the Steelers, I think, telling us that they expect Roethlisberger to be fine with the fact that they did not add any quarterbacks to their quarterback room this offseason. Dave, when you look at DeAndre Hopkins at number six, we know moving to Arizona, there's been some conversation maybe that he's got a knee issue that could be a problem at some point. Contract situation could be a problem at some point. What do you think about DeAndre Hopkins for 2020 and beyond? Well, for 2020, I still like him. Love, I actually love the fit him with him with Kyler Murray. He's going to be the number one target there. It doesn't mean he's going to get 150 of them, but he's going to get a lot. And I still think he scores double-digit touchdowns with the Cardinals, just as we've seen him do before with the Texans. For long term, I am a little concerned. The way that I would um, navigate through this would be to draft DeAndre Hopkins in Dynasty. I'd try and wait as late as possible to do it. 
And I would still feel okay because there are so many young receivers, last year's class, this year's class, tons of talent there. I can put them on my bench, and then when DeAndre Hopkins goes sour, I've got young talent to replace them in my lineup. So I'm not as fearful about having Hopkins on my dynasty team. I can win now with him, and then I'll dump him later and have a bunch of younger receivers to pick them. There was one point in the last couple of years where people were talking about Odell Beckham as the number one overall pick in dynasty four matches based on youth, based on what he was showing us with the Giants. And then as we've seen, injuries have become a problem. And last year he was fighting through an injury with his first year in the Browns, but not playing at a very high level. We know that Kevin Stefanski not going to have this wide open passing game based on what he did in Minnesota. And they added another mouth to feed in the passing game in Cleveland this offseason with Austin Hooper. So Adam, when you come out and you see Beckham at number nine, do you like that? Or is that a little bit too high? I think it's right within a, a reasonable range. I think you could make a case for A.J. Brown, for Calvin Ridley ahead of him. Uh, but Beckham still is one of the most talented players. He played through a sports hernia injury basically the entire season. They had a horrible year. I love that they added a right tackle to shore up their offensive line. I love that they changed their coaching staff. Uh, I'm not convinced they're going to be what the Vikings were in terms of how run heavy the Vikings were. And the Vikings weren't run heavy every single year. They had some years where they threw a lot. Uh, recently. So I, I like Beckham as a top 10 guy. I think that's perfectly reasonable. I, I guess it just seems like everybody's so down on him this year. How did he end up as a top 10 guy in Dynasty when, you know, Heath, I, I don't think you have Beckham as a top 10 guy in redraft. No, right. what this comes down to is, it, and I talked about it earlier about the upside factor. I don't, there's not very many receivers that you can argue have more upside if things go right than Odell Beckham. And he's not too far from a top 10 guy from this year. I think he's 13 or 14, but he is a little bit higher just because if they get everything corrected in Cleveland and he goes back to getting nine targets a game, he could absolutely be a top three guy this year. And it shouldn't be that surprising. Let's go now to 11 through 20 of the wide receiver dynasty rankings. And maybe a little bit of a surprise to see one Falcons receiver over the other. Calvin Ridley at 14, Julio Jones at 17. We are, we're there already, Heath, with the youngster over the veteran? I've had to push and prod and pull and do everything I could to get Julio Jones into my top 20 wide receivers because the first uh, round of this I did, I think he came out about 28 or 29. There's just there's a lot of warning signs for wide receivers once they get past 30, they get to 31, 32, 33. Most wide receivers, not all, but most see a significant reduction in their performance. And I would anticipate over the next couple of years, we're going to see Calvin Ridley outperform Julio Jones. If nothing else, he's going to be better over the next five years than Jones is. Adam, you're a big fan of DK Metcalf. You were singing his praises as a rookie. You see him here at number 16, Terry McLaurin at number 18, both wide receivers coming off strong 2019 rookie seasons. Who do you like better moving forward? Their numbers were really, really similar last year, too. I like DK Metcalf. I just think when you have a guy with his size and his speed, and just a body type that, I don't know, was David Boston the last guy that looked like DK Metcalf? Yeah, you just don't see wide receivers like that. So it just makes me think he can be a different beast. They said they're going to line him up all over the field this year. I think the, the combination of size, speed, athleticism makes DK Metcalf somebody that's tough to project his ceiling. I think I think he'd be one of the best wide receivers in football. He's also, he's got that like alpha dog mentality, that diva wide receiver. look. Like, he knows how good he is and how nasty he is. And I kind of like that. It looks like he plays with a chip on his shoulder. I don't want to call him a diva, but I, that was the wrong word to use. But the, you know, the nastiness that I like, I like the way he plays. So I just have a, I, I just have a fantasy thing for DK Metcalf and I would take him ahead of McLaurin. Mark the tape, May 1st, 2020, Adam Azer calls DK Metcalf a diva. Let's go now to the <laughs> list, 21 through 30, and you know we're getting some more interesting names here, and now the rookies are starting to show up. You got Jerry Judy, you got C.D. Lamb. So, Heath, why Judy over Lamb? 23 for Judy, 24 for Lamb. I think there is a clearer path to Jerry Judy becoming the number one wide receiver on his own team. He could possibly surpass Cortland Sutton as soon as the end of this year. I don't really think Lamb has a great opportunity this year. I'm not sure he has a great opportunity in the next two years to become a number one. And at that point, you're looking at three years down the road and who knows what's going to happen then. I had these two oh so close before the draft. It's just a small flip to go from Judy over Lamb. They're both fantastic. Dave, I want to save some time so we can get to some tight ends, but just answer one question for me. Just give me the name. 
Who would you rather have moving forward, C.D. Lamb or Michael Gallup? Lamb. Okay, so taking youth over what the proven guy is, and I think probably a lot of people would agree, take C.D. Lamb over Michael Gallup. Let's take a look now at the final list of wide receivers, 31 through 40 here, and this is some other rookies finally showing up. You got Henry Ruggs on this list, and LaVisca Chenault as well, Jalen Rager, seeing these guys and how we go about this. So Heath, why Ruggs over Rager and Chenault? I, listen, I have some questions about Ruggs' possibility of becoming a number one wide receiver, but being the first wide receiver drafted in the NFL draft is certainly worth something. Being maybe the fastest player in the league as soon as you are drafted is absolutely worth something as well. I worry a little bit about Derek Carr, but Derek Carr probably won't be his quarterback for very long, so it's, it's the speed and it's the draft profile. Dave, we know that you would take Rager over Ruggs. Adam, I want to ask you, give me the ranking of these wide receivers, and we'll throw Justin Jefferson into it as well. So you got Ruggs, you got Rager, you got Chenault, and you got Justin Jefferson. Give me the order, just the names. Okay, uh, I'll go uh, Ruggs, Jefferson, Rager, Chenault. Okay, so there's the ranking for Adam. You see the ranking for Heath, and Dave would take Rager ahead of Julio Jones, based on this point, how much he loves that kid. So uh, when we come back, we're going to take a look at the uh, tight ends here for Dynasty, give you a sneak peek at that position as well, and tell you about two sophomores that could have breakout potential. Noah Fant and TJ Hawkinson coming up next here on Fantasy Football Today. Welcome back to Fantasy Football Today. Here are the Dynasty rankings from Heath Cummings, the top 10 tight ends that we're looking at here. George Kittle. Number one. Most of the time we're looking at Travis Kelsey at number one. So Heath, are we at that point now where Kelsey, because of age, is behind both Kittle and Mark Andrews? He is for me, and it's just exactly the same thing I said last segment about Julio Jones. The history, even for elite tight ends, past the age of 30, not very good. I think Kelsey's got one more elite year left. He may have two more year, elite years left, but we should expect a drop-off coming very soon. Noah Fant at number nine, TJ Hawkinson at number 10. Dave, you like these young guys a year ago. They may not be in the best situations because the Broncos adding a lot of wide receivers. TJ Hawkinson not showing us much as a rookie last year. Both guys not showing us much as rookies last year. Is this where we should be looking at them at the back end of the top 10? They are because they're young and youth is served in dynasty and it matters and tight end is a lot like wide receiver where you can find veteran players and older players that you can get later on. So if I'm not getting one of the stud tight ends early on, I don't mind spending, what would it be, like a mid-round pick or so? on, on fan, well, It wouldn't be mid-round for a dynasty draft. It would be like round eight or round nine to get one of these guys, and then I'll find another tight end later. And that would be my tight end core for the next three or four seasons. Let's look now at the list 11 through 20, and there's one name that jumps out because he's back in the NFL, and that's Rob Gronkowski, now a member of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And there he is at number 17. So, Heath, we don't know how long Gronk's going to play. We don't know how long Brady's going to play. We don't even know if this is going to work out. How'd you go about Gronk at 17? All I can do is just laugh and shrug and throw a dart. There's just absolutely no way to tell. He didn't play football last year. He didn't look that great the last time that he did. But he's the best tight end to ever play football. He's coming back to play on a team where defenses can't double team him because of Mike Evans and Chris Godwin. He's still got Tom Brady. He could be a top four guy this year. He could retire after week three. Who knows? <laughs> that's a that's a great way to put it. Uh, Adam, when you see some of the young tight ends on this list, Jonu Smith, Dallas Goddard, Mike Gusecki, even Ian Thomas, who now gets a hopefully good situation with Greg Olson gone, how do you look at those guys and sort of project them moving forward? Could these be the next crop of guys that we're talking about as the top 10 tight ends in, in fantasy? It doesn't take that much to be a top 10 tight end in fantasy. You're going to find some pretty <laughs> underwhelming names there. But if you want to talk about like real difference makers, I personally don't think so. I'd rather make a real buy low play on OJ Howard and just kind of think this year's not going to be the year, but they picked up his fifth year option. Maybe next year's better for him. Maybe they trade OJ Howard. He'd be the first name I look at if I'm just looking to buy very, very low on someone who could be a real impact tight end. And I, I like Noah Fan and Hawkinson better than the group you just mentioned of Johnny Smith Kosicki. I know Heath does, everybody does, but I think they have a good chance. I don't like that that kind of mid-tier range, the 14, 15, 16 range at the Dynasty tight end. They're okay. I don't see huge potential for most of them. I'm, I'm moderately excited about John Do Smith. I want to see how he's going to do a full season as the starter. Delaney Walker, no longer a member of the Titans. And we'll see if he's the second best receiving option behind A.J. Brown. Corey Davis has obviously not worked out, as we're finding out. Titans not picking up his fifth-year option. 
they do not want to pay him. We asked for some of your tweets in regard to some dynasty questions, and so let's take a look at what you're asking us, and hopefully we can help you with your dynasty leagues coming up this offseason. Nicholas wants to know three picks, top six in dynasty rookie draft, three, four, and six. Need help everywhere. Who do I choose? All right, Dave, who you got? Three, four, six. Well, I would want to get one of the stud running backs up that high and then two stud receivers to go with them. So let's say J.K. Dobbins at three, maybe Judy and Rager at four and six. Next question we have comes to us from Malachi. Malachi wants to know, what's the chance Damien Harris does anything this year? Also, is Justice Hill and Preston Williams worth holding on to? Keith, what do you think about those three guys? I would like to think I was in a deep enough league to hold on to all three of those, but if I had to rank them, Preston Williams would be my favorite to hold. There's a chance that he's the number one wide receiver for the Dolphins, and then Hill, and then Harris. Next question comes to us from Tej. Tej wants to know, rebuilding that picks 1, 5, 12, 13, 14, 17, and three-thirds in a rookie PPR draft have Kyler, Juju, A.J. Brown, and Ronald Jones as best running backs. Uh, should I hold on to or use Debo or Fant to help upgrade one of the team picks with the hope of adding another running back? So, Adam, are you holding on to Debo and Fant, or are you just going to take a running back at one, maybe running back at five, and maybe throw some darts on guys like Josh Kelly, Darrington Evans, maybe DJ Dallas with some of those picks in the team? Thanks for giving me the short question, Jamie. I would trade Debo <laughs> Samuel short and pick, pick 14 or 17 to get another top five pick if you could do that. I don't think you can, but if you can get another top five pick and have three top five picks, yeah, you could be set up for a lot of success. This is the fun of uh, the dynasty and rookie rankings, taking all these picks and looking at all these trades. Fun show. Good job, Heath. Good job, Adam. Good job, Dave. Thanks for watching Fantasy Football Today. Want more of the Fantasy Football Today podcast and nonstop year-round fantasy advice? It's simple. Hit the subscribe button and hang with us all throughout the year.